Well, we are continuing our sermon series called People for the World. And it's about showing and sharing the love of Christ. And so we're taking these uh, summer weeks to focus on our outward orientation as Christians. So you can think of Christians and churches as having three primary directions. So there's an upward orientation in worship. There's a, a one another orientation toward community. And then there's an outward facing disposition of mission. And so all three are essential for a church to have in order to be healthy. If you only focus upward in worship and you neglect community and mission, then you are minimizing and reducing what God has for his people to a very narrow vision of life. But God's plan has always been not just to save individuals, but to create a community of worship and love. And so if we worship in isolation, we're actually not even worshiping as truly as we think, because if we truly worship God, you become like him. And what is God like? He is others oriented and he's a God of love and mission. But if we only have worship and community, but neglect mission, what happens? Well, then we become an ingrown church. We become a selfish community. We keep the joy of knowing God to ourselves. But God has given his people, and he's given us as his church, this noble purpose to share Christ's love with others. So we need all three, and this focus in particular is on mission. So healthy Christians worship God, they live in true community, and they also become people for the world. They want to show and share the love of Christ. So this morning, we're going to look at the Great Commission. So uh, the Great Commission is usually seen as occurring at the end of Matthew, but we're going to look at a less well-known one. So there's four stories of Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew is the most common commission at the end, but the Gospel of Luke also has a version of this. So it's in Luke 24, verses 44 to 49. If you don't have a Bible with you, it is printed out on the sheets that were handed out before. And here we see the resurrected Jesus appearing to his disciples. They've been confused by his death. They did not expect him to rise, even though he had told them. And then he showed up in their room and he demonstrates that he's not a ghost. He's truly risen from the dead. And then he commissions them and he gives them this eternally significant and global purpose for their lives. And this is the purpose that every Christian is to embrace. So if you're not yet a believer, this is what you're invited into as you begin to trust Jesus, not only for the forgiveness of your sins, but to embrace this new purpose. Um, and if you are a Christian, this is yours to live out. So let's read this together. Luke 24, beginning in verse 44. Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So Jesus gives this purpose to every Christian, and he's inviting us then to understand and participate in this epic story of mission. He gives his disciples then, and we still have these now, exactly what we need to participate in this mission. So there's five things we see here that we need, and Jesus gives us to participate in his mission. He gives us a biblical theology, a liberating message, a global plan, a missional identity, and a spiritual power. So we'll walk through each of these uh, together here from this text. So first, he gives them a biblical theology. So biblical theology, by that I mean the whole Old Testament is a unified story. So biblical theology is a term that we use to refer to the message of the Bible as a whole. And here Jesus shows us that the whole Old Testament, right, all of Scripture up to that point, was pointing forward to him, the whole Old Testament is a unified story, not just a collection of random commands and sayings and stories. It's ultimately a unified story 
that was moving toward Jesus. And what's striking here is that Jesus doesn't just say that the Old Testament anticipated and pointed forward to his death and resurrection. It also anticipated his mission. Do you see that here? Look at verse 44, how he put it. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. So he'd been teaching them this through his ministry, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So we'll, we'll pause here. He's referring to the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, a typical Jewish way of referring to the three major parts of the Old Testament. He's saying everything written across the Old Testament must be fulfilled. And I love how Jesus and the New Testament authors use this language of fulfillment so often. It refers to filling something up, up or bringing something to completion. So on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, the whole Old Testament, to bring the whole thing to its goal. So the Old Testament is a story waiting for its completion in Jesus. All of its themes are fulfilled in him. But this wasn't obvious to to his disciples. Jesus taught this all through his ministry. So if you want to learn from Jesus, how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament, read the gospel narratives and pay attention to Jesus himself and what he says about himself. Something greater than the temple is here. Someone greater than Jonah is here. He's the son of David, yet greater than David and so forth. But the disciples didn't get it because Jesus needed to open their minds. That's what happens in verse 45 here. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. You can read the Old Testament and miss, many do, that the whole thing is straining forward toward the coming of Christ. Before Jesus opens our minds, reading the Old Testament is like walking around in a dark room, right? The light's out, your eyes can adjust a little bit, you can make out some of the big pieces of furniture by feeling your way around the room. But when the light comes on, You see everything. You're not making up things that are there. You're seeing what was there that you missed. So that's what happens when Jesus opens the minds of people. The Old Testament's like a darkly lit room. We see some of it, and then Jesus opens our minds, and we see what it's really all about, and we see him there. And so Jesus shows us what we can expect then by reading the Old Testament. So here's his summary in verses 46 and 47. He says, The Old Testament anticipated both a Messiah and a mission. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So Jesus' point here is that he's been talking about this all along and everything's already right there in the Old Testament. The Old Testament speaks of the Messiah's death and his resurrection and his mission. So notice Jesus is saying the Old Testament spoke about his death. He said, it said that the Christ should suffer. So Christ um, is not his name, it's a title, refers to the Messiah or anointed one. So kings like David were anointed. And when they failed, the prophets would teach that there would be a coming true Messiah, one true king, one true Christ, but he would suffer. So we saw that in the pattern of David's life, King David's life in the Old Testament, suffering and then enthronement, suffering, then glory. And then Isaiah, we saw last week, said a servant would come who would be a king, but he would suffer first and he would die for the sins of his people. We also see the resurrection of the Messiah in the Old Testament. Could Jesus adds here that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. So Isaiah 53, prominent text in the Old Testament that speaks of this coming servant king and says he would not only die, but he would also rise and be vindicated. Hosea 6 spoke about how Israel experienced a kind of death in their exile, in their time under judgment, and that they would be restored on the third day, after two days. It was a symbolic way in Hosea of talking about Israel's restoration being like a kind of resurrection from the dead on the third day. Jesus came as the true Israel to embody their life, and then he took their death on the cross, taking the fullness of exile and judgment, and then he died literally on the third day, fulfilling those expectations. And then we also see the the mission of the Messiah. This is verse 47. He adds, 
that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Now, for a long time, as I was understanding how to put the Bible together, I saw that I was learning the Old Testament points forward to Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, and that the themes converge in him. And it wasn't until after a few years of studying that that I realized what Jesus is saying in verse 47, that it's not just that Jesus was anticipated in his life, death, and the resurrection, and then from there, that Old Testament anticipation stopped, and now we just go tell people because Jesus had a good idea to command us to do so. No, the mission itself that we are to participate in as his people, that itself is part of what the Old Testament was explicitly anticipating. So the mission is a central theme through the whole story of the Old Testament. God created the world. He created humanity to reflect his character and spread his glory as they reflect it across the globe. But humanity sinned and failed. So God chose Abraham and his people Israel, not just to be his people, but to be a light to the nations. He blessed them so that his blessing would spread to the nations. Then they failed, like Adam and Eve before, And when they failed, God promised, we saw this last week, that he would send one true human being, a true Israelite, a true Israel, a true servant, and he would live the perfect life everyone's failed to live. He would die taking our judgment upon himself for our failures to live. And then he would rise and be vindicated. And he would carry out this mission to restore Israelites and be a light to the nations. And so this is the first thing Jesus gives his people for mission. He gives them this biblical theology of not only this anticipation in the Old Testament of a Messiah, but also a mission. He's saying the Old Testament anticipated that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in the name of the coming Messiah to all nations and that that should start in Jerusalem. He's saying you get that from reading the Old Testament. And so he gives us this to equip us for mission. So here's one reason why that's important. If someone asks you, as a Christian, why should Christians tell other people about Jesus? And why should we take the gospel to the nations? One obvious answer, perhaps the most common answer, and a right answer would be, because Jesus commanded us to. And that's a good enough reason. However, Jesus gives us more than that as well. He shows us, that all of history is an epic story of God's mission. And we get to participate in this mission. One way to cultivate a desire to share Christ with people and to support global missions is this. It's to see how the whole Bible tells the true story of the world as a story of God rescuing people from every nation through his Messiah and how he sends his rescued people to keep taking this message to more and more people and all nations. So that's part of the motivation Jesus is giving us to live on mission. Now, a second thing he gives us is a liberating message. So Jesus says the message that we share, that itself was also anticipated in the Old Testament. Christ would come, he'd suffer, he'd rise, and then this liberating, freeing message would be proclaimed. So here's how he put it in verse 47. You can note this with me. He says, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name. So repentance means to turn around. When we repent, we're turning away from sin and we're turning toward the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. Or think of it like this. Repentance is about reordering our loves and reordering our lives. So we reorder our loves. God himself, Father, Son, and Spirit, become our supreme love. Everything else is subordinated under that supreme love. And then we also reorder our lives. We order, reorder our priorities around Jesus and his priority in our life. And Jesus says the result of this repentance is forgiveness of sins. So sin is anything we do out of a self-centered heart when we had not ordered our loves and our lives properly. And the surprising reality is that even when we do good things, we can be sinning because we can do good things for our own selfish goals without God as supreme in our hearts 
having a disordered life with ourselves as supreme or some other idol as supreme of career or a good family or success or being well-known and well-liked or maintaining power and control over people. Some other supreme God is really ruling our hearts. And so even good things we do, you can run a nonprofit and serve people for good your whole life and yet be oriented ultimately for yourself and for your own name and recognition. And we go through our lives accumulating real guilt because of our sins and we deserve judgment. And the liberating message from God himself, the one whom we've offended, is that the Lord Jesus has come to bring forgiveness of our sins. Absolutely removed, no more guilt, no more shame, no more condemnation, and every human being needs to hear this liberating message. If you are a Christian, it's because you have heard this message and the Lord Jesus has opened your eyes and opened your heart to receive it, and you are now living now and forever free from any condemnation. Maybe you wouldn't identify as a Christian, but you're curious about Jesus. I found that people are surprised to find out just who the real Jesus is. Many people think Jesus' message is essentially about rewarding good people. But Jesus, his message is actually about forgiving bad people and then transforming them. So if you have not yet trusted Christ and you're curious about him, consider just how liberating this message really is. Is there any way, any other way you can think of to experience this kind of deep, eternal, cosmic forgiveness? To have all your guilt, all your shame that you carry, failure, all of it forgiven by the very God who made you. And for him to do it, not begrudgingly, but because he loves you, sincerely, and from his heart. So Christian, this is the heart of the message we get to share with people. Real people have real guilt, and Jesus offers real forgiveness. So now who needs to hear this message? Well, third, Jesus gives us a global plan. So he came to bring this liberating message to people from all nations. And this is the rest of verse 47 again. He says that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus is drawing on the text that we looked at last Sunday, if you were here, Isaiah 49, verse 6. That summarized Jesus' his own vocation. And we saw that he had a two-stage mission. First, to bring salvation to Israel because they failed to be a light to the nations. He needs to restore Israelites, all who would trust him. And then to bring light to the nations, all nations from there. So this is the prophetic pattern. Israel first, then the nations. And in Isaiah, you'd expect this to start in Jerusalem as well, because Isaiah speaks about Jerusalem being the center of Israel and the center of the nations from which the light would shine. And so Jesus came to fulfill this prophetic pattern. He focused his ministry on Israel. He was dialed in toward Jerusalem, which is where he died and rose. And then he now has risen and he says, it's time to go out. And even when he sends his people out, he tells them that this needs to begin in Jerusalem. It's to fulfill this prophetic pattern, to restore Israel, beginning in Jerusalem, and then go outward from there. So I mentioned last week that Jesus is not just giving a general plan to everyone, which is like, start where you are, wherever you live is your Jerusalem, and then go outward from there to the nations. No, for us, it's not that Zionsville or Brownsburg or wherever you live around here is your Jerusalem and you go out from there. That's a fine idea, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. When he tells his disciples to begin in Jerusalem, he actually wasn't saying begin in your hometown. They weren't from Jerusalem. They were from other places. They start in Jerusalem because this fulfills the pattern and the story that the Old Testament was telling and would be fulfilled in Jesus. So you start with Israel and then you go to the nations. And so Jesus did that through his ministry, restoring Israelites who would come after him. And then now he says, go to Israel and then go to the nations. Israel first, then the nations. So here's what this means for us. First, this means that you and I, right now, living right here, in the Indianapolis area, we live among the nations that Jesus is talking about. If Jesus was to kind of unfold a bit more of his plan to his disciples there, 
He would say, you start in Jerusalem, you keep going. And you know what's going to happen? Long after your death, the gospel is going to travel the world, and eventually it'll come to a place called Zionsville in this Indianapolis area. And there's going to be a group of Christians sitting outside on a hill a couple thousand years from now, and they're going to be hearing my words to you that I'm speaking by the Spirit to them as well because they're among the nations. So go to the nations, spread the gospel to them. And so now the gospel has come to us. We are among the nations. And so what do we do? Well, we, we keep spreading it here among this area where we are. And we find out where there are other nations who need the gospel and haven't even received the gospel yet. So we want the gospel to go to as many people here as possible, but there are more nations to reach. There's still people groups and language groups that have not yet received Christ. So this means the mission that Jesus gave has not yet been completed. This is why we as a church are so committed to global missions and reaching the least reached people. So Jesus sent his people to take the gospel to all nations. The idea of nations here that he mentions isn't referring to uh, geopolitical nation states. It's more like a language group. So think of a people group that has its own language, its own ethnicity, its own culture. The world has something like 16,000 of these groups of people that have their own uh, culture and language. Many of those groups have heard the gospel. Christians are among them. Churches are among them. We are one of those language groups that has Christians and churches, many of them. But many of these groups actually still need to hear the gospel. They don't have churches among them, or they have so few Christians among them that the vast majority of people in that people group, and it could have been any of us who was born there, the vast majority will grow up, live their life, and even if they live to old age, they will die having never met a Christian and having never known who Jesus was. That's happening. That is reality this very day. Most of these unreached or least reached places are in what's called the 1040 window. So it's just this region uh, that includes North Africa, Middle East, India, China, Southeast Asia. About half the world's people groups live there. 7,000 of these people groups are considered unreached or just barely reached. And it's because there's less than 2% of that group are considered Christians. So that's over 40% of the world's population is living in people groups where less than 2% of the people there are Christians. There's still a couple thousand people groups that are unengaged with the gospel. So there is no church planting going on, um, going on among them at all. And about 1,500 of these language groups don't yet have a Bible in their native language. So this is the mission Jesus gave us, and we get to and we need to be a part of. So he gives us this global plan, but it's not just the task that he gives us. It's our very identity. So that's what we see next. Look at this missional identity Jesus gives us in verse 48. Do you see what he calls his disciples? He says, you are witnesses of these things. He repeats that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and there he makes it even more explicit as an identity statement. He says, you are my witnesses. So now some may think, uh, hold on a second. Jesus is calling those disciples his witnesses. That's not all Christians. Those disciples saw Jesus. They saw the resurrected Jesus. They received his mission. This isn't for us. We weren't witnesses of those things, but he really does include all Christians here. And here's how we know. Because once again, the background of this statement that Jesus says, you're my witnesses, this is from Isaiah. Isaiah, in Isaiah, God called Israel his people as his servant. And he said there to be a light to the nations, but then they failed. So he sends them into exile among the nations. And he's among these nations in Babylon and elsewhere where it's just filled with idols that the nations worshiped, false gods. And Isaiah gives us this picture in Isaiah 42, 43, 44, and so on of these nations gathered together with their idols. And God tells the people, the people of Israel among the nations, he says, you are my witnesses. And here's what he means. He says, you will affirm that I alone am the one true God and that the idols are nothing. They've made them up. They cannot save. I alone am the one true God. I alone am sovereign over history. I plan the end from the beginning and I alone am the savior. And so you be my witnesses. 
to this. And so now the risen Christ is speaking to his people just like God spoke to Israel. He's saying, you have known me. You have seen me. You know that I am fulfilling all that the Old Testament prepared. The nations need to know that their idols are empty and worthless and they can't save them. I alone am the true God. I'm the savior. My people are my witnesses. You are my witnesses. So there's two kinds of witnesses then. The first kind are those apostles who were eyewitnesses. They saw the risen Jesus. They have a unique authority and their authority matters to us today because that Bible you're holding, that is their testimony in the New Testament. The New Testament documents go back to their authority. But the second kind of witness is the rest of Christianity, the rest of Christians like us. God called his people witnesses in Isaiah. Jesus is drawing on that. It's a, it's a term for all his people. So we've come to know Jesus. If you're trusting in Jesus, you have come to know the one true God. You know, you know, you know that he's alone as the Savior. And so we have this privilege of living as witnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ to gently show people that their idols cannot save. The idol that they're living for, the thing that's controlling them, their career, a beautiful family, wealth, success, health, power, control, a life of ease and peace and comfort, these things that control us, that can never live up to our expectations, that never satisfy, that will let us down. Jesus is saying, Christian, you are my witness. You have renounced your idols. You've reordered your loves and reordered your lives. You know that I alone am the risen Christ and the one true God. Go tell people. Go tell people that I alone can satisfy the longings of their heart. Go tell people that they are under an eternal judgment, that I will forgive them of all their sins and set them free from. So if you're a Christian, this is your missional identity. You are called, I am called, to live as a witness to our neighbors and nations. You can give personal testimony to how Jesus has rescued you, and you can point to the eyewitness testimony in the New Testament. But what can you and I really accomplish here? We can get fired up about this, really excited about biblical theology, really excited about this liberating message, this global plan to go to the nations, embrace our identity, this missional identity, but you and I can't change anyone's hearts. I hate rejection. We may not be good at moving conversations along to get to Jesus eventually, even knowing people for years. And we're like, how have I still not brought Jesus up somehow? He's not good at it. And maybe you've tried and nothing's happened. So this is why Jesus gives us a final gift for mission. And the last thing he gives us is a spiritual power. Look at verse 49. Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. That's the Holy Spirit, promised from the Old Testament. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So you and I are powerless to do anything about this mission. You were powerless to save yourself in the first place. But the word came to you through a person or through reading, clothed with power from on high. And the Lord Jesus opened your heart. The Holy Spirit gave you a new heart. And you were rescued and you saw that Jesus alone is the true God and Savior of the world. And now Jesus is saying, I'm sending you out and you will be clothed with power from on high. Now the disciples needed to wait, but this isn't a call for you and I to wait. They were waiting for the day of Pentecost that would come a few weeks later when the Holy Spirit would be decisively poured out on his people. And that Holy Spirit comes upon every believer who is a Christian. You are clothed with power from on high to live as a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. You go to bed, you wake up, you brush your teeth, clothed with power. You befriend people clothed with power. And it's for the sake of loving them and showing the love of Christ to them and then speaking to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you do, you are clothed with power from on high. And the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit, does his work. So notice the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father. That was a promise from the Old Testament, that the Spirit will be poured out and bring new life over the earth. He does it to whoever he wants, 
He does it whenever he wants. We can't control it. But this gives you and I incredible confidence, doesn't it? I mean, doesn't, is there anything else you need? You have the liberating message of Jesus and you are clothed with power from on high. And so what do we do? Well, we live as witnesses with complete reliance on the Holy Spirit, knowing he's with us and he's eager to bring people to life. God loves the people that you long to come to know Jesus more than you do. And you have the Holy Spirit with you. We live then with hope, knowing that the Spirit can open blind eyes, and we pray. This is why we always couple sharing the gospel with prayer, never just doing one or the other, because we ask the Spirit to do what only He can do. We ask Him to give us courage. We ask Him to soften the hardest person. And then we know that He uses the words about Jesus to do that to people. So a few final implications here. First, let's live in light of this big story. Jesus' mission is much more than a one-off command that he gave at one point. This mission is part of the whole story of the Bible and the world, and he gives his people this identity as witnesses. So we're part of a noble story of God's plan to love and forgive sinners. And then he dignifies you and I with this purpose in this mission as his witnesses for his glory and for the good of people we love. So how do we apply this to all of our lives? Well, I love the way that uh, Chris Wright put it in one of his books on mission. He said, we don't so much hear all this kind of stuff about mission and try to apply it to our lives as if there's some kind of corner of our life we need to plug this into or some like moment in our life that we need to act on. We don't so much apply this to our lives, but we apply our lives to this reality. In other words, you don't just take this and say, when in my week I'm going to plug a little, a little mission in. No, you apply your whole life to this reality, recognizing that you are in a story, you have an identity, so adjust and reorder your life and your life vision to align itself with this big vision. So let's learn to live in light of this big story of God's mission. Second, let's take a step to live as a witness to Christ this week. Here's one way to think about this. When Jesus sent his disciples on mission, that mission was launched and it's continuing and surging. And we're now living in one of these faraway nations right now. We're among the nations. So if you're a Christian, live as a witness here among the nations. You have a mission-oriented identity. So think about it like this. If you were actually a missionary, let's just say you left your culture and went to another culture to bear witness to Christ, how would you order your life? What would you do? How would you intentionally love and bless your neighbors? How would you pray for your coworkers and classmates and friends? What would you spend your evenings doing? How would you plan to introduce people to other Christians that were part of your mission team? You would be thinking about those questions, wouldn't you? If you've left your life to go somewhere else among a nation, to share the gospel? Well, if you are a Christian, you are planted here by God among the nations as a witness. You're in one of those nations that Jesus spoke about there. So how might your life look differently if you embraced and lived out your identity as a witness? If you were a cross-cultural missionary here, I mean, think about this. You would have a lot of barriers. You'd have a language to learn. You'd have to figure out how to navigate uh, normal cultural practices here. But if this is your home culture, then you actually don't have those barriers. So you're actually ready to go because you're you're indigenous to this people. And so let's be a witness to Christ. So engage in friendship with people who don't know Jesus. Love them well as those who are made in God's image, not just as a project. And then over time, talk about what matters most in life and let them know how Jesus has made a difference in your life. Tell them stories that Jesus told that have impacted your life. Invite them to meet some of your Christian friends. Pray for them. Give them a book that's been helpful to you to help them understand and know Jesus. If they offer, talk about a book that they're loving, say you'll read it too, and then you can have one for them to read as well. So live out your identity even right here. And then finally, um, get involved or continue to deepen your involvement with global missions. 
we value global missions here as a church. We've been um, growing in this from the very beginning, and I've been encouraged with steps that we've taken over the past few years. We've clarified our vision for global missions. We've clear, we have clear values for our mission work. We have a mission team that embraces this and loves Christ and loves this mission. We have mission partners that are living as witnesses around the world. We have many of you, many members who are partnering in ways to support and encourage and pray for our mission partners. We have been able to give more toward missions. We've added more mission partners over the past few years. We've begun adding an increased focus also as part of what we do to focus on the least reached places where the gospel's not yet been able to saturate a culture or break into a culture. So my encouragement would be for you to ask these questions about, about yourself. How can I, thinking of yourself, how can I pray for our mission work and the gospel to spread? And build this into my regular prayers. How can I give toward Christ's mission? How can I encourage a missionary, a mission partner? How can I consider going or being sent by our church family to take the gospel. So these were some of Jesus' parting words to his church. He gave us everything we need for mission. He gave us this beautiful biblical theology of his plan for the world. He gave us this liberating message that we couldn't think up a better one if we tried. He gave us a global plan that every square inch of the world is to be covered with his glory. Therefore, every language group needs to hear of Jesus. He gave us a missional identity, not just inviting us to add this to our life here and there, but to live as his witnesses. And he gave us a spiritual power. He clothes us with power on high for this mission to be successful. And this gathering that we're, I mean, just look around. This is evidence that Jesus wasn't messing around and that the Father, Son, and Spirit have been advancing this mission across the globe. We're the fruit of it. And so now we get to be invited, not just to have our hearts thrilled and filled by the love of Christ, but to bring more people. I mean, may the Lord cause this hill to be saturated with more and more people in coming months and years through us as we're clothed with power. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise you for your wise and gracious, merciful plan to rescue people from every people group on this planet. We thank you for your plan to give your son. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you for being the true and faithful one, the one who's done what none of us have done or could do in living perfectly, perfect life of love and beauty and goodness and justice. Thank you for taking our judgment on the cross in your agony we praise you for rising from the dead. We thank you for commissioning your people and clothing them with power from on high. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would stir our hearts to love this message, to love Father, Son, and Spirit, and to love our neighbors and the nations. And that you would do amazing, miraculous things through us in bringing people to faith in Christ. So we together as a church family want to be low before you, Father, Son, and Spirit, and open to you. So please use us. Do things beyond what we could ask or think. In Jesus' name.